Well, as Justin mentioned, it is great to have you back in the house of the Lord today. We are delighted to see so many of you, and uh, what a joy to have you with us. And for those of you who are live streaming, it's always good to have you with us as well. Hey, a number of uh, months ago now, um, when we were talking as pastors about maybe the next series we would go into, we talked about the fact that in the quarantine, in the crisis that our world seemed to face, that maybe studying the character of God would be beneficial to us. And so that's what we started to do. We took a look at, we, I qualified seven qualities of God that I thought would be valuable for our study. Uh, his goodness, His mercy, uh, for instance. Um, and one of those qualities was His justice. Because when we face a crisis or a conflict, I thought, you know, you want to know that in the end, God will make it right, right? That we're just not victims of the circumstances in some way. I could not have foreseen uh, when, we were, when, when I laid that series out that the events would happen additionally in the world in which we live. Um, the death of George Floyd and the way our nation um, responded to that in so many different ways. And it caused me to think of the word justice differently. And I began to th- wrestle with that word. And I- I'll be honest with you, um, it, this is the kind of message that probably doesn't really satisfy you regarding wherever you are on your political stream or your personal stream, but I think it does nonetheless return us to the scriptures in that matter. As I wrestled with it, I talked to a good friend of mine, and I said, hey, listen, you know, will you pray with me about this? And um, they said to me, sure, I'll pray with you, and they reminded me to just stick to the scriptures, okay? And being that I'm married to that good friend, I thought that was good advice. And so that's what we're going to do today. Um, I want you to take your Bibles and go with me to Psalm 97, verse 2. And I'm going to tell you in advance, we're going to move through a lot of passages. I would encourage you to just, if you're taking notes, just grab the reference, okay? And then when you get home, you can take a look at that reference yourself. So we want to understand what I'm going to call justice biblically. And we're going to do that in two ways. We're going to take a look at God's example of justice, both in his character as well as what he does. And then we're going to look at our responsibility of justice. Now, we now live in a world where racial injustice, social justice, these are words that are just, they they just fill our news feed. We see them all the time, right? And everybody has an opinion of what we should do or shouldn't do. Um, I I was reminded that when it comes to that phrase, social justice, a term that will come up today in our conversation, that I want to be where um, Thabiti Anbuli is, a pastor, when he says, when it comes to the social justice issue, most of our knowledge has come from personal experience we've had or the political influence we've had. We've not been discipled well from the scriptures. And so when it came to this issue, I just said, Lord, I don't have the time to read everything, but I think I do have the time to read what your Bible says about justice and about you. And so I I just searched the word justice. I found 130 plus expressions of the word in our Bibles, New Testament and Old Testament. And I began to compartmentalize those. I said, okay, this is dealing with the justice of God. And I found about 35 or 36 passages that would fall in that category. There clearly is in the Old Testament, particularly from the prophets, a a call that the governments would exercise justice properly, and so I began to drop those in a category. There is a personal expression of justice that we would be engaged in, and then I had this whole other section, about 36 passages that dealt about justice on behalf of the oppressed, those who are widows, those who are fatherless those who are immigrants. And and all of a sudden, I'm reading the scriptures, and I'm saying, what do I do with all of these? Like, justice, the way I think of it, or you thought of it, is maybe we have a justice department. We have uh, have a justice system. We, We think of the term in our English understanding that it must be punishment. But why does it call for justice unless no less than 36 occurrences, as many as it calls for, uh, it refers to the justice of God, it also refers to justice on behalf of those who are oppressed. And I started to think, okay, I, I need to understand that from the scriptures. So let's start with this, and we'll take a look at God first, and then some applications for us. Psalm 97, verse 2, the Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice, let many coastlands be glad. Clouds and thick darkness are all around him. Kind of sounds like a big majesty element where you're just thinking about God, and here it comes. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. 
So one of the first things I understand is that in God's, justi- in God's justice and righteousness are closely related. God's justice and righteousness are closely related, both being relational words. We tend to think of it as an objective kind of, there's the edict, there's the justice. But when you read about the words in the scriptures, you're going to see that these are not only things God is, but these are things God does. And so we have to ask good questions about that. In fact, let me, let me just introduce you to a few concepts here. Um, righteousness, that word in Psalm 97 too is the Hebrew word tzedek. It means God does right. God does right. He is an only right. He does right. And justice, the Hebrew word mispot, means God makes right. And that makes sense, right? When someone has done something wrong, they have an obligation to make it right. That's that part of justice. Now, just kind of chase that through the scriptures with me, and here's where you might want to write down some of the references. Take a look at Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4. For there we read, The rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright. See, just and upright is he. Notice the focus. His work is perfect. That is something God is doing. His ways are true, just and are justice. That is something God is doing in the lives of the people around him. In fact, we see this over in King Nebuchadnezzar's expression of it in Daniel chapter 4 as well. He says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, for all his works are right and his ways are just. See how righteousness and justice again are together? And they're tied together in something that God does. Okay, Hold that thought for a second. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. In other words, we see justice and righteousness as the foundation of God, and therefore we interpret, however we understand these words, we interpret them as critical to our understanding of God. And then notice, um, you may remember Abraham's argument with God back in Genesis 18 where God sent a messenger and said, I'm going to destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, and and. And note this, that Abraham argued not from the mercy of God, but from the justice of God. For there he says, surely you wouldn't do such a thing, destroying the righteous along with the wicked. See how it's a relational word? Why you would be treating the righteous and the wicked exactly the same, surely you wouldn't do that. Should not the judge, there's that justice word, of all the earth do what is right. It's a wonderful reminder that righteousness and justice come together and God tags them into relationship. And then... You can almost see it from Genesis 18 all the way to Revelation. Here it is again. And they sing in Revelation 15, 3, and they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and amazing are your deeds, O Lord the Almighty. Just and true are your ways. A a king of the nations who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name. For you alone are holy. All nations will come and worship you. We come worshiping the Lord because of his justice and his righteousness. Now, I'd mentioned to you those two words, righteousness and justice, come together, but we need to talk briefly, if we could, about another idea, what I'm going to call retributive justice and restorative justice. Now, these aren't original ideas with me, though maybe my definition of them is. When you think of retributive justice, you're thinking that retribution, that someone has done wrong and there should be punishment. In fact, this is one of the great arguments for, that's fascinating to me to have with an atheist, like an atheist would say, we're all, there is no God, we're just victim, we're just those who, who, who evolved in some way and came up in the world in which we live. But, but where is that moral element? Because they would argue that you can't treat them poorly, so the atheist would say, listen, where does that idea come from? And the moral argument says, hey, we're made in the image of God, and therefore that idea that there is right and there is wrong, however you define that, um, there is right and there is wrong, m- m- must be punished if it's wrong. But I want you to think in terms of another word, restorative justice. And that's in the scripture used about lifting up the weak. And, and this is where it, uh, the scriptures themselves grab my attention. Because I remember how I said 36 of the uh, 130 plus verses about justice talked about lifting up those who are weak, protecting those who are vulnerable. And I started to think, wait, that's not how I think of justice. I think of justice as someone's punished, but I have to deal with these other 36 verses. Let me give you a few of them, and you'll see them together. Isaiah 61, verse 8 says, For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrong. I will faithfully give them their recompense. That's retributive, right? Let me stop there and explain that in the culture in which we live. 
That means that, specifically here, that when, when racism is practiced, God in his justice says there is punishment for that. But likewise, when robbery is practiced or destruction of property is practiced, God says that's retributive justice. Okay? But the, there should be punishment for that. But the next phrase, look at this, and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. It's a term that speaks of relationship and that, that God, there will one day come a day where we have this everlasting covenant with the Lord and that's restorative. That's not punishment. In fact, Ezekiel 34 kind of captures that same idea. And just let me kind of open your mind, if I can, with the scriptures to this idea that if you always thought of justice as retributive, that is that someone has to be punished and that's the idea that the Bible also includes another element for here we read, I will seek the lost and I will bring back the strayed and I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak and the fat and the strong I will destroy. I will feed them in justice. How does justice work with the lost and the strayed and the bind up, binding up the injured and those who are weak? How does justice work unless it's restorative? Or how about this one in Jeremiah chapter 22? Did not your father eat and drink? This is, again, God speaking to uh, the king jo Joahaz, Joahaz about his father, Josiah, who was a good king. Joahaz is not a good king. And he said, did not your father eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? See the two words together? Then it was well with him. Here it comes. He judged the cause of the poor and needy. Then it was well. Did you see that? If you only thought of justice as retribution, then you probably haven't thought holistically about the rest of the scriptures that use the word. He judged the cause of the poor and needy, then it was well. And I love this phrase, is not this to know me? Wait, what? God is saying, listen, if you really want to know my heart, know that in my justice, I do punish those who have done wrong, but I also attempt to lift up those who are weak and broken. And for just a moment, think about that. Isn't that the case? Anyone who has ever came to come to faith in Christ knows that because we were, Romans chapter 5, weak and Christ died for us. We were sinners and Christ died for us. We were enemies of God, weak, sinner, enemies, okay? It's not going to get much worse than that. And in all of our condition, Christ is the one who came. It is precisely that that should cause us to think about the word justice differently. In fact, maybe one of my favorite texts on this matter is found in Isaiah 30, verse 18. Therefore, the Lord waits to be gracious to you, and therefore, he exalts himself to show mercy to you, for the Lord is a God of justice. Now, what's that word doing there if it's only an act of retribution? Blessed are those who wait for him. It has to be an expression of restorative justice. That is, that God is lifting up the weak. In fact, that's kind of the way that we tend to think of mercy when we see justice and mercy together. Now, God's justice and righteousness are closely related, both being relational words, but God's justice and mercy are not mutually exclusive. If you only thought of justice as God bringing retribution or punishment, then justice and mercy shouldn't show up in the same sentence, but they do. They're not mutually exclusive. It is God's mercy that motivates his restorative justice. In fact, a good way to think about mercy is the idea of pity, that God looked on our condition and had pity on us, and he wanted to do something, and so he sent his son. That's the picture. God's justice and mercy are not mutually exclusive ideas. They're combined. It is his mercy that motivates restorative justice. Right. Now, Hopefully, you're starting to think, it may be a little confusing, but you're starting to think differently about that word than you may have thought about it in the past. And what I want to do in just a moment is talk about our responsibility with it. Um, we looked at God's example, how God uses the word, how God exemplifies the word, and it's just not in a legal sense, it's also in a lifting up the weak sense, both are there, okay? But we want to talk about our responsibility of justice. And I'm going to tell you in advance, when I wrap the message up, that idea of application is probably where you're going to say, um, I don't agree with that. And I'm going to tell you right now in advance, I'm totally okay with that. Because application is where we can have disagreement. Our practice of restorative justice on the spectrum is going to be different. The Spirit of God may be speaking to you and your conscience in a matter differently than he's speaking to mine. What's important is that we understand what the word is in the scripture so that the Holy Spirit can help us apply it well. And it's also important, I think, that we just acknowledge 
in a listening, learning, loving mentality that we may interpret our experiences around us differently. In fact, um, I love the way that Tim Keller mentions this. He says, as Christians, we disagree on social justice issues because of our different experiences, whether white or black, and we tend to universalize our experiences to others. That's part of the challenge, is when we look at these issues, those who are weak, those who are impoverished, those who have faced difficulty, those who are marginalized, when we look at them and say, listen, I'm supposed to lift them up, if we're not careful, we only interpret their struggle through our experience or through our political agenda. The Bible doesn't let us off that easy, right? God doesn't let us off that easy. We need to listen well. And so I've asked a friend of mine to come and share, and I'm kind of excited about that because um, she can speak to the fact that the idea of racism or those who have been oppressed is not just an, an American issue, it's an international issue, it's a worldwide issue. And she's gonna come and share a part of her story here. So Irina, come on up if you could. And I want to set this up before we get to the application so that your heart is challenged to um, be thinking in terms of, in terms of um, making sure that you are a faithful and adequate listener um, and that you're hearing, there you go, Rena, um, that you're hearing a broader perspective of what's going on in the world around us, and you're uniquely positioned to talk about that, uh, Rena, because well, I'll ask the question, for those of you who are here, um, I ask it in the first hour this morning. How many of you ha were born and raised in America? You've never been out of the country, okay? Most of you, okay? Now watch this. Look around. I know there's not a lot of people here like there normally is, but you can still see the show of hands percentage-wise. How many of you were born and raised in New Jersey? about the same amount of hands, okay? That's really crazy, okay? That tells you that from the very beginning, your perspective is not only limited as an American, but it's limited as, as a New Jerseyan, okay? Um, and, you know, some people would say you talk funny. I'm not saying that, I'm just saying that some people would, okay? So here's the thing, okay? For all of us, we tend to universalize everybody else's pain only if we've experienced it through our eyes. So, Rena, you didn't grow up in America, did you? You couldn't raise your hand on New Jersey? No, I could not. Okay, and where did you grow up? So, I was born and raised in India. In India? It's only been 19 years since I came into this country. Okay, great. And uh, Nina, uh, Rena and, and Simon normally sit in, in the back, back there, okay? Um, so, if you've seen them before. Um, but you grew up in India, and we were talking about... Um, in, a nas in an international way, how the caste system tended in India to create an oppression Absolutely. on people. Yes. So w we're Americans, we're New Jerseyans, we ba maybe studied that for a little window in history, but we never experienced it. Mm -hmm. So tell us about it a little bit. So caste system in India is like a social hierarchy, and mostly for Hindus. So everyone based on who you're born to, either you are at the upper class or the lower class. So the upper class are like the Brahmins, the teachers, the priests. Uh, the lower class would be the untouchables and all the worker class in between. Mm. So if you're on the top, you don't feel the injustices that are around you. But if you are on the lower class, you do not get to go to school. You do not get jobs because if you were from like my grandparents' generation, just by knowing people's last name, you know what caste they belong to. Wow, that's amazing. So um, because of the family you were born into, you were Correct. already caste. Yes. There was no equity. There was no ability to rise up out of that. There is there? none. You're not offered none. In fact, you had mentioned when we were talking about it earlier that when it comes to even getting a job, you knew not to even apply. For the Absolutely, job, because they know as soon as somebody reads your resume and sees that last name, you don't even get a fair chance. So why bother? Thankfully, after 1947, the Constitution has protected everyone, so you don't see it as much as a bigger city. So I grew up in a city. I did not see it as much, but when I go to visit my grandparents, uh, like the older generation still can see the last name and know, like, Which oh, yeah, that's it. yeah. And in, in the untouchable category, mm -hmm. um, for those who were oppressed in that setting, are you telling me that you couldn't even really carry on a conversation? It was inappropriate at one stage to even talk or acknowledge them. Oh, absolutely. They are like, they are like the peasants that work in your farmland, so they cannot even come to certain distance of your house wow. because you are born into that caste. 
you do not belong with the upper class. Yeah, now when we were talking about this, and this was something I didn't know, I asked you, did you experience that? And you said, I actually experienced the opposite of that. And this is really insightful, okay? So get ready for this, all right? How did you experience a total alleviation of all classes if indeed that was how it had, the culture had developed it? Yes, so I did not experience because I was born into a Christian family. Okay. So my grandparents, my great, actually my great-grandfather was the first pastor for his pastoral wow. church in India. So when disciple Thomas came to India in AD 52, he established churches in the southernmost tip of India. So most of Christianity spread from there. So as growing up as a Christian in a Christian family, I never experienced what people would tell me. So when we had converts coming into the, when they converted and come, came into the church, they would actually stand outside not knowing where their place is. Can we talk to you? Do we sit in the back? Do we sit on the floor? And it's almost like everybody's welcoming them with their open arms and saying, no, 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 come on in. So for an you, untouchable, for the first time, they yeah, were accepted in, kind absolutely. of like the way that James talks about, that yeah. they should just be accepted with, without. Yeah, and it's just one of those things, being youth leaders and stuff, you just welcomed everyone, and you're like, no, we are one in Christ. You're made in God's image, so what is the difference? You don't need my permission to read God's word, to understand and be one. Mm. That's a really beautiful expression. I want that to settle in for you, that even in a world that had lived with those classes for all of those years, the Christian church turned that whole thing upside down, didn't it? That's so just, just remember that as we go forward, okay? Yeah, 28 million of us in India now. And 20 million Christians. Christians yeah. And hoping that that will just multiply. Wow. So that's just a great reminder how um, we don't necessarily see everything through another person's eyes. We tend to experience it through our eyes. Absolutely. But, um, Rena, you're, it's appropriate that you talk about this because that wasn't only your history and your life, but when you came to America 19 years ago, you saw uh, a bit of that directly here. So let me just take a moment and, and brag on, on, on uh, Rena for a second, okay? Um, she last year was the uh, teacher of the year at Kingsway. I know this is embarrassing to you, but that's okay. I'm going to do it anyhow, okay? It's a pastor's privilege. We can do that, all right? We can embarrass our people from time to time. Um, and she uh, received the award for the entire state of New Jersey as the outstanding teacher in biology, right? And yeah, that's right. That's worthy of applause. Thank you. Thank you. And the applause further embarrasses, uh, <laughs> embarrasses her, so I love that, okay? Um, so... Take a moment, and let me just clarify something for you real quickly. Uh, Rena, while I'm sure you have excellence in your teaching, um, one of the things that was noted from students and from others is that her love for the students was what made her qualified for the award, okay? That's an important part to understand because of what we're about to share. Because Kingsway isn't the only school you've taught at, right? So tell us a little bit about your first experience teaching here in New Jersey. So when I came into New Jersey, um, I first, the first school I taught in was mostly more diverse. It had probably 80% of it was like African American population. So coming in um, as a Christian, um, for me, America is a Christian country. Nobody should behave any, any like that's your, that's, that's, you your, about that's it in your steps. Yeah, like yeah. that's how all your life should be as a Christian. So coming into a school where the faculty was not as diverse, I started to see a division and I would see kids not being able to, you know, address the issues that are happening. A simple one that stuck with me was a kid, literally a, a, another teacher came to me and said, can you go talk to this kid? He never gives me anything, um, and he's just lazy. So I don't know what his issue is. And I remember that, did you ask this person? He's like, well, can't talk to that person. I said, okay, so I reached out to this kid, and the simple answer was, I am asked to do a web quest every other night. I do not have a computer, um, and I cannot go to a library because I have watched my siblings. Mm. So I said, why didn't you just tell the teacher that? They're like, well, just because how I look, she won't even give me a chance to speak. And that breaks your heart. Mm. Like, you just think like, okay, you would have given that chance to anyone else. And for me, as a Christian, I value every single human. And just going, taking that back to a teacher, a child's life was changed because that person realized, oh, that's it. And that's it. Mm. 
just it's, had to listen. It, it's a beautiful reminder, isn't it, that we tend to look at everybody through our own set of Correct. eyes. So that particular teacher saw whatever was being said as an excuse without listening. And by the way, just by way of reminder, um, maybe you've tried this from time to time, that the dog ate your homework, okay? Uh, that may be an excuse, and so therefore you perceive that as an excuse, but for somebody else, maybe the dog really did eat their homework. Are you with me in that? So the point is this, that we tend to only view people yes. through our perspective, and we don't give consideration to how God might have us look at where they are, not making Absolutely. excuses. No, no, not making excuses. And in both schools, and it's, I came here, I started Kingsway, and it's funny, like one image that I ended up using in both schools because of different reasons, mm -hmm. but all had to do with race, is I started class at different times, but both schools. I started class with an image on my PowerPoint where there's five men standing, all are different colors. Mm -hmm. And I said to them, what do you see? They're like, mm, men from different races. Uh, different humans, like they start to give biology answers. Mm -hmm. And my next answer was five skeletons. I said, now pick out the ones with different colors. And they're like, hmm. <laughs> so I know in a school system, you know, you're kind of careful about what you say. I said, well, we are made of God's image. And that is our template. That's mm -hmm. our blueprint. And from there where you build. So if you see skeleton first, can you identify everything? That's a really good, that's a really good illustration. Probably why you're Teacher of the Year. Okay, so <laughs> anyhow, here's, here's your picture again. I want you to see a broader perspective that you probably learned something about the church in India that you may not have known before. You may have viewed the church in India through your own eyes of church in America. But I also wanted you to hear a teacher whose heart is broken when we tend to view someone else's experiences only through our own, right? And that's going to be important because the idea of justice has to do, in large part in the Scripture, with not only bringing judgment, but also lifting up those who are weak, right? You can find plenty of verses on that as well. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you again, Rena, for your testimony and your example in the community. Um, let me move, if I can, to the idea of application. And as we do that, I mentioned to you earlier that people are going to be on different spectrums on the application of these truths, that's okay, that's okay. Um, if the Spirit of God is speaking to you one way, that's okay. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a biblical consideration that is a verse or two that causes you to say, okay, I have to acknowledge that this is part of the responsibility of what we call restorative justice, okay? And then I'm gonna move to what I call your natural objection because I know good and well that the moment I put some of these things up there, your mind is automatically gonna throw up an objection, right? And then we're gonna talk about personal solutions. So we're gonna do this kind of quick, so stay with me. When I begin to look at justice in the scriptures, what I begin to understand is that there were several definitive applications of where justice, that is this restorative justice, lifting up the weak, should take place. And I'm gonna give these to you backwards, kind of like a top three list, okay? We start with the lowest, we move to the next, and finally we get to the last one, as regards to you and your responsibility. So here's the first one. The responsibility of restorative justice is in part the responsibility of our government. Now notice I said in part, and I give you as biblical consideration for that, okay, this passage in Proverbs 29, 4. By justice, a king builds up the land. Think about that for a second. Not by justice, a king protects the land. That would be retributive justice. That is, punishment falls upon the wrongdoer. But by justice, a king builds up the land. That is, in some way, he, with that restorative justice, strengthens the people, lifts up the weak, helps those who are in need. But he who exacts gifts tears it down. In other words, when the king or the government starts to saying, hey, we want this for ourselves, they're not necessarily helping those who are weak. In fact, to get even more definitive, look at what Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 10. He says, what sorrow awaits the unjust judges and those who issue unfair laws? This is the government, right? They deprive the poor of justice and deny the rights of the needy among my people. See it? They prey on widows and take advantage of orphans. What will you do when I punish you, when I send disaster upon you from a distant land? God says, listen, retributive justice is going to fall on the governing officials that are in part not taking care of those that are needy. Now for just a moment, hold on. Don't freak out on me. Don't say this puts me in one political camp or another political camp. Don't try to guess that. Just deal with the scripture. The Bible is clearly saying that the government has some level of responsibility. 
You may be over here on that spectrum, you may be over here on that spectrum, but the government bears some responsibility. And in some 20 passages, when I begin to study it, um, the Bible referred to the king or the rulers of Israel or someone who was responsible for this restorative kind of justice. Let me give you your natural objection, okay? Uh, Just by way of reminder, that's the biblical consideration. Here's your natural objection. I don't like how our government does it. I get that. There's times I don't like how our government does it either. But just because you have a natural objection doesn't change the fact that in the Bible there are some mentions of the king exercising restorative justice. And that gives me a personal solution. If you don't like how the government does it, then you got some options. Pray, right? 1 Timothy 2 charges us to pray regularly for the kings and those in authority that we may live peaceably in the land. Now, just for a moment, ask yourself this question. I'll let the Holy Spirit apply it, not me, all right? Do you pray more about our government or do you complain more about our government? Just think back. If you're not sure what your answer is, then ask, ask the person sitting next to you and they'll probably be honest and tell you, okay? Do you find that you're scrolling through your news feed and all you see is things to complain about? Or do you find that you're setting apart a time to pray? Because that's what we're charged to do. Not only that, as God leads, get involved. Your participation, regardless of what kind of government it is, is still necessary. In fact, in Esther 4.14, Esther's cousin said to her, listen, who knows but that you were appointed for such a time as this. Esther, do something. It's just a great reminder. This is the personal solution. Don't fall prey to the natural objection and please understand something. As your pastor, I'm just trying to tell you, the Bible does talk about the government's role, but that's not the only means. In fact, sometimes we err by thinking that the government, others might err by thinking that the government, when they do everything right, if that day would ever happen, um, when they did everything right, everything would be okay, and I just want to remind you it won't be, okay? It won't be. Here's why. Notice what W.S. Reed says. He says, social justice will never really come in by legislation. It depends rather upon the scriptural condition of the people of a country. Sin is the basic reason for social injustice, so that the only cure is to curtail sin. And while this can be done to a certain extent in outward manifestations by laws, a more radical cure is necessary. Men must be brought back to the willing service and enjoyment of God as their Savior and Lord. Okay. There's your answer. But that doesn't mean that there isn't some role. It just means that it's a limited role. And our part in that, by way of application, is to participate in some way. Here's the second element. Regarding your application of the idea of ju- the justice of God, this restorative justice, what ought we to do? And here, here I would point to the fact that your responsibility for restorative justice is in part the responsibility of your church. In fact, notice how, how uh, Paul writes about that over in Galatians chapter 2. He says, in fact, James, Peter, and John accepted Barnabas and me as their co-workers. They encouraged us to keep preaching to the Gentiles while they continued their work with the Jews. Their only suggestion, verse 10, was that we keep on helping the poor, which I have always been eager to do. Notice preaching in verse 9, that's the message, helping those who are poor, lifting up the weak, that's that restorative justice idea. Paul was eager to do that. Both can be done. In fact, I'm going to give you the natural objection. If we focus too much on physical needs, we'll neglect the gospel message. Um, I get that. But here's what I would tell you, that the Bible is focusing on physical needs too. It's just not saying ignore those to the exclusion of the message. It's not a a either or. It's not you got to do this or you got to do this and there's there's a great gulf in between. It's a both and. It is saying both are necessary. In fact, let me give you a personal solution to that natural objection. The Bible tells us to do both. It doesn't say just do the one, okay? And I recognize there can be errors on one side or the other, but in your personal application, in your role in your church, the Bible is asking you to do both. Not just be the message giver, not simply be the ministry server, but to do both. In fact, James 2 says, listen, what good do you do if you bring in a brother and you say be warm and be filled and go, and yet they're still hungry? There is a place for both. And then finally, can I add one other element? Jesus exemplified both. In fact, just take a look at Matthew 11, where in Matthew 11, Jesus is asked the question um, from the disciples of John. John wants to know, are you the one they should be looking for? Is there another? And he says, go and tell John what you hear and see. 
Notice what Jesus says of his ministry. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. You do understand that Jesus confirmed his deity by doing miraculous works on behalf of those who were weak, blind, uh, lame, lepers, those who were deaf, those who were dead for their families, and those who were poor. Jesus didn't exclude those. His ministry was almost exclusively to those, and yet he preached. You with me? Jesus exemplifies this for us almost perfectly. And let me give you one other comment to look at. Just go home and look at it yourself. Luke chapter 10, Jesus sends out his disciples to preach the gospel. And so someone might say, great, that's what we're supposed to do, go preach the gospel. But then all of a sudden at the end of Luke chapter 10, Jesus tells the parable of the Good Samaritan, right? Same chapter, same Bible, same book, same chapter, right? Both someone caring for someone who's in need, lifting them up, because they, they, they've been abused and hurt and they can't be cared for on their own. And by the way, religious people ignoring them. And then also telling his disciples to go and preach. And that brings us to the number one answer, uh, where you are the most responsible for practicing restorative justice. Right? Here it is, your personal involvement. You can't say it's the government's responsibility. You can't say it's the church's responsibility. It is but even if they're not doing it the way that you want, you still bear a personal responsibility. In fact, look at Micah chapter six, verse eight. He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice. Notice it's justice here is something that is done. It's something you do. It's not an opinion. It's not an intention. It's something you do. And to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. We are responsible for looking at those who are weak, who are poor personally and saying, how can we participate? There's a wonderful story at Fellowship in um, the life of a young man that we met in Haiti. You may have heard it before. Um, he was a poor child in Haiti. He was supported by Americans. Our church took an interest in him. Um, we helped him and we helped fund his education largely. And it didn't come out of the church's effort. It came out of individuals' efforts who begin to say, I wanna do something on his behalf. Today, that young man is, uh, has passed all of his exams and is now training to become a neurosurgeon to return to his country. Okay. Now, you got to know that there is no way in his present, in his previous condition, he could have done that without other people saying, we want to help. And when restorative justice is practiced, God raises people up. That's your image. That's your picture. I can remember that uh, when I um, traveled into Bosnia a number of years ago, we were serving um, those who were in need. Um, we were serving them bags of flour and coffee, and the particular, um, the particular um, um, camp that we were going to, those individuals had been there because they had no jobs, but they were ruled by a Mushahadeen, that's an Islamic fighter. He, he was there in, in my missionary friend's first experiences to go there. They basically, he basically said to them, said to him, listen, I want nothing to do with you. He purged the soil with oil to say, listen, you're an American, we have nothing to do with you. And so my friend Lou took us back there again, like for the third or fourth time, and I was expecting that same kind of response. And what I saw was a man who was violently opposed to the Christian God and the gospel who suddenly wasn't anymore who invited us to sit down and have coffee with him, who wanted to talk about why we did what we do. And I remember this, that I asked the question through the translator, why the change? I'd never met him before. And you know what he said? He looked at my friend Lou and he said, because this man kept coming even after the cameras left. That is, charitable organizations poured in there as long as the news was there. But when the news left, only one person kept coming. Your service is not meant to replace your message. The two are to work hand in hand. And perhaps you might say, well, I have a natural objection, Phil. I'm only one person, what difference can I make? I'm just one person, after all, what difference can I make? And I would tell you, trust God, not your sense of inadequacy. Trust God, not your sense of inadequacy. Look back at that passage in Micah chapter six, verse eight. Here it is. He has told you, O oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice and to love kindness. Here it comes. And to walk humbly with your God. 
Acknowledge that though you're only one person, maybe God could use you as one person to make a difference in another person's life. In fact, we think of Hebrews 11 kind of as our hall of faith chapter where individuals and their faith are listed one right after the other. Um, You just begin to read how all of these people practice their faith. At the end of that chapter, it kind of swells, almost like a crescendo. It's moving towards this huge thing where God's about to say, listen, these people were so uh, impactful and powerful. And Hebrews says, for time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David and Samuel and the prophets who through faith conquered kingdoms, say this phrase with me, what's next? Enforced justice. Huh, amazing. Individuals practice restorative justice on behalf of the weak and needy. Obtain promises, stop the mouths of lions, quench the power of fire, escape the edge of the sword, were made strong out of weakness. Can you imagine? There is David, there is Samuel saying at some stage, I'm only one person, what can I do? But in their weakness, God's strength was revealed. They became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. I would tell you regarding um, your particular natural objection, I'm only one person, what difference can I make? Trust God, not your sense of inadequacy. I came upon a statement in my study this week by Vodi Bakum who reminds us that when I see the image of God in others and remember the fact that he died for them, I realize that makes those people significant to him and that makes those people significant to me. That's how you and I should look at it. We may disagree upon our application of it, but all of us should be asking God, what is my part in lifting up those who are oppressed, who are weak, who are needy? Because they are significant to God, and that should make them significant to us. Father, it's been a privilege to look to your word this morning. We are grateful and we are thankful for your ministry on our behalf, and we pray that we would follow you in all that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for coming this morning. We have another service that's about to follow this, so I'm going to ask you to slip to the back if you could, uh, so, and put those masks back on again if you could as you head out. Thank you for joining us on this worship day, and we look forward to having you with us next Sunday, and invite some friends. There's room, okay? There's room, so invite some friends next Sunday. God bless you as you go.